Hello, oral surgery colleagues, and welcome to the Oral Surgery Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Richard Moore, an oral surgeon based in the United Kingdom. The aim of this podcast channel is to discuss ways of improving practice in oral surgery, thereby creating a better journey and patient experience, and allowing us as clinicians to become better oral surgeons. All discussions on this channel are based on personal experience and opinions, which should be thought-provoking and supplemented with further research and evidence-based practice. Without further ado, let's jump into this podcast. So hello and welcome to this podcast. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Furhan Ahmed today, and we're going to talk about his current clinical practice and focus on full arch work. So good evening, Furhan. Good evening, Richard. Thank you so much, so much for the invite. It's a pleasure. And uh, you're a, I see from social media, you're an exceptionally busy chap all over the country. So thanks very much for spending the time with me this evening. Um, I think for our listeners, it would be great if you could just perhaps give a bit of a, a synopsis of your clinical practice and perhaps where you are today and how you got there. Yeah, my pleasure. So as a Richard alluded, my name is Farhan. I'm, I suppose I associate myself as being someone that's uh, a bit of a disruptor. I like to think of myself as a, as a creator, but ultimately, if you if you're asking me like what do you do, I'm I'm an implant dentist, and an implant dentist with a huge focus on training education, training education, and helping other clinicians upskill, especially in the field of full arch implants, but. Going back to the early days, yeah, in 2005, I qualified as a dentist and naturally I wasn't aligned to anything specific. So I did this sort of two year program that gave me a good uh, variety of different specialties. And, and there I was, found myself in Southern General Hospital in Glasgow, being mesmerized by the surgeons walking about doing the craziest of surgery. And I thought to myself, yeah, I want to be like them. And so it's there where I was inspired by the people I was around that I thought, yeah, I can, I can do this. I want to do this. And so I went off to Liverpool to study medicine. And then four years at med school were great, but up and down the country, trying to make ends meet, trying to, uh, I had a mortgage flat. I had to try, try to pay that. I had to borrow money off people, working night shifts, traveling for four hours from Fife after an on-call, weekend on call, suturing up. Uh, drunk individuals and then struggling to keep my eyes open at at, at clinical skills training it kind of uh, you know mustered through but enjoyed the process of the new environment in in Liverpool and and meeting new people and and being in that different environment and then naturally I, I was sort of I got married and, and I was drawn back up to home which is Scotland and where I'm based now in Glasgow and so I got married and we moved back to Scotland and I did my house jobs. And I think at this point, you know, I did medicine with the view, yeah, I wanted to do max facts, but I want to do medicine because I want to better myself. I want to great, gain more knowledge and it'd be a good thing to do. Uh, and I did F1, F2 because, uh, you know, I it, like dentistry, you have to do this kind of year where you get full registration and, and it's the same in medical. I got a two-year post. And again, it was a, a wide array of, I did A&E, general surgery, general medicine and, and whatnot. So it was a lot of fun and I had a job. But during those two years as a foundation doctor, I had to make a decision. Did I want to go down the route of max facts or did I want to step away and, and you know, look to something else? Uh, you know, ideally general practice. And uh, an opportunity arose, an opportunity arose for me to join a, a group of clinicians that were uh, building a group of dental clinics and they wanted to bring me on as as the clinician with a focus around oral surgery sedation and naturally someone that would then develop into doing implants. And that's what I did. I was very fortunate. I was around some amazing clinicians that, and they helped me develop, um, not just as a, a primary care clinician, because prim primarily before my, all my experience was in secondary care, as a primary care clinician and, and, and understanding the nuances of the NHS in primary care and, and private uh, dentistry, they helped me develop as a clinician. I started doing implants. Uh, I started doing more and more complex implants, bone grafting, and then naturally on to full arch and then more complex full arch. And, and that's where I am today. But really where the biggest change 
And the biggest sort of shift in my career has come is when the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, we I asked myself this question, what am I doing? What, sh- what can I do? I'm sat at home. I'm, I can't work. I need to give back. And a mentor once always told me that it's really important to find the gift in every situation. And I looked for the gift and what was the gift for me? And it was like, well, I can give back and can start teaching. I can, I've got a wealth of experience over 15 years in clinical practice. I can give back. And so I I went online and I started teaching. I, I set up two courses. My flagship course was a full arch implant training program via Zoom. And then uh, I set up a starter program for the GDPs looking to take their first steps into implant dentistry. One thing led to another. And now, from someone that was 100% clinical working in practice, I'm 85, 90% education, where all I do is travel around the country, mentoring and teaching clinicians around full arch primarily. So, you know, COVID has been had a huge impact positively and negatively for many people but for me it's been the single biggest positive impact uh in my life and that's covid because it gave gave me that time to to think step back and go what am i doing and allowed me to try something new different and it's really uh it's blown up to something so much bigger than i could have ever imagined i I mean i think having it's interesting because i've I'll admit I've read your well, I've read three quarters of your books. I bought it before the podcast. I thought I have to read it, but it's it's you know that whole story of your kind of pathway to success, and just listening to you talk about it there, which is reflected in the book. But it's it's so interesting that COVID had such an impact in a different way than some people to develop that education side. Which I think you know, having a colleague who's been mentored by you, it's obviously something that. I think people are very really appreciate it because otherwise that would never have happened or it may have happened in the future. So I think it's it's brilliant that you now have that ability to to provide mentorship and, and education for clinicians because particularly with full arch work and any implant work, it's absolutely critical, isn't it, to have the appropriate training by somebody with with the experience such as you. Yeah, so I think that the real thing that I've been able to develop and, and, and work on and what's resonated with a lot of clinicians is I really try to get to know the clinicians I'm working with. And that's because education and it should be personalised. Yeah. Now, I need to understand you as a person, Richard. If, if, if I want to train you, I need to understand who you are, your background, your environment, what makes you tick, where do you work? Where do you want to go to? You know, some clinicians come to me and, and they've started implants and they want to get to full arch, but do they actually understand what's involved in going on that journey and developing as someone that's a full arch surgeon? Mm-hmm. And the commitment and the time and the effort that's required, that's cool. If you understand, great. But if you think it's just like, oh, I'll do a few cases and I'm fine, no, that's not how it works. So my job is to understand you as a person and understand how it is that you learn and how I'm going to get you from A to to B. And B is the goals that you've discussed with me. So a lot of the discussions I'm having with clinicians is a lot about getting to know them, building a relationship, and it's a relationship of trust. Because I can't mentor you if if there's there's not a relationship of trust. So we have to build that trust. Uh, You need to get to know me, and I'm not for everybody. You know, I'm very acutely aware I'm not for everybody. And the other thing is uh, I can't train everybody either. And it's about making each other fit and assessing, do we fit each other? Can we form that team? And then we can go on a journey together. And ultimately, the journey always starts with self-belief and confidence. I'm a big, big believer that I need to get to know you and and then understand, do you have that belief and confidence that you can go on this journey as well? Because that's what holds a lot of people back. A lot of people feel that they just, oh, no, that's not for me. That's really complex. That's difficult. But let me tell you something. The work I do is easy. It's not difficult. It really is not difficult. Appropriately, stepwise progress, sensible treatment planning around the right people as I was mentored and always still looked for advice from people that I look up to, you'll be fine. 
absolutely yeah. and, and it's often telling them if i can do this you can do this don't worry about the how i'll get you there but all i need you to do is believe that you can get there and then we'll get there and the other thing is it, it's not a race you know I, I may have done it in three years it might take you five that's okay we're all on our own journey it's not a race we're just going at our own pace and enjoy the process yeah I, and that that's a really unique approach that I think, you know, when you go through any kind of other training program, perhaps specialty training or anything, that mentorship is very different, isn't it? And what you've just described, I think, is probably what we all need and getting to know your trainee and your mentor and, and fitting that jigsaw puzzle together and planning it is absolutely critical. So I think it's a it's a great process. And for anybody that's thinking about getting into full arch work or even just implant work, that's the way to do it, isn't it? It's it's really important to do that. Um, yeah, hundred percent, Richard. You know, it, it's that. Uh, so the way I, I, it's a for me, it's a five step process. So I'll, I'll just allude to it. So first of all, I always work on I, I get to know the person. So self belief, confidence, and try to get to understand the mindset of the individual. And then there's the theoretical aspect. Uh, so I, the theory, a lot of it's online, and then the third aspect is the one to one. So one-to-one mentoring. And then the other thing is, which I find has massively helped the clinicians I work with, is being part of a community. So I'm a big believer that we learn better together. We were all trying to push each other. It's not a competition. We're pushing each other to be better. We're we're clapping when someone's done well, done done a case well, etc. And then reflecting together when when we've been challenged. And then the fifth step is about uh, uh, virtual uh, mentoring so and and what I allude to with virtual mentoring is that even though you're now starting to do this type of work independently you're still part of the community and and there's still people around you to bounce ideas off because it doesn't matter how good you are how much you've done we can always learn and we can always get advice from others because it's important to get a different slant of things and I'm very cautious and fully aware someone that does full arch all the time. I'm very uh, single-minded in my approach to treatment planning. And it, it's true. You know, like When I see a, an OPT, I'm like, full arch, full arch. <laughs> I, I, I need to step back. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm very cautious to ask other people, do you think, am I being aggressive? Do you think this is appropriate? This is my thought process. What do you think? And, and that's where the community comes in, where I have a case and I can put it up to everybody and say, this is my thoughts. Uh, what do you think? Would you agree, or would someone think, no, we we need to come up with a different solution rather than something that could be perceived as being a bit too aggressive? Yeah, so, uh, that the community approach is is again really critical as well, isn't it? Because sharing, and it doesn't matter how much experience you've got, how much you've done, it's like you know, if I get stuck with something at work or you're struggling, you know, you should never. If you think, oh, I'm really struggling with this, it's always great to see who's next door. Can you just come and have a look at this? And never, you know, feel like you, you're undermining yourself for asking for a second pair of eyes or a second opinion because you know two minds are better than one. And that sharing ideas and complications and challenges is is again really important. And yeah. ultimately, it, it's it's remembering. For me, it's remembering why are we doing this? Yeah, it's the patient. We and you develop, you know, you learn stuff every day, don't you? Or every week, you, yeah. there's always new things that you can learn. And people do things differently. And you think, oh, that's a really good. I might just, you know, take that and use that as well. Um, Let me give you an example. So I'm, I'm, I'm working with someone really closely. And he's been working with me for four or five months. And he's an implant dentist. And he's on a journey with me to, to get him to do full large independently over 12 months. So four months in, and I'm looking at a case and I'm like, right. Hey, Johnny, we're, we're, we're doing this and, and I'm planning to do this. And he's like, uh, so it was actually a, a zygomatic case. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to put a zygoma on the right. And I'm thinking, he's like, well, Ferran, hey, could you do a transcyrus here? And I'm like, I looked at him and I'm like, yeah, I could. And do you know what? That's what we did. Yeah. And what what that resulted in less invasive surgery for mm. my patient. Yeah. And I, I said, do you know what, Jonathan? Well done. Well done, because you had the courage to speak up and say, well, you've, you've talked about this before. It, would, would this be an option here? And I was just fixated on yeah, yeah. doing the psychoma. And I'm the first one to admit that 
I will look at a case over and over again, and then I will look at the next time I was like, I plan this, but I'm seeing this now. And then someone else looked at it and brought up something and, and then change your mind. So yeah, it, it's, it's, I'm a big believer in that. And I've got numerous examples where I've changed things for the better because mm. someone's brought up something that I, I was blind to. Yeah. So full arch work, I mean, I, I haven't done a vast amount. I've done some and I've kind of stepped back a bit from it now because I don't have the restorative skill and ability to do it. And it, if I ever do do it, I tend to do it with somebody that's going to do the restorative side. But I think it seems to be more, certainly the places that I work at, there seem to be more cases coming through the door or even patients just presenting themselves that have Googled, you know, uh, I don't know, fixed fixed dentures, whatever they put into Google and have come and said, you know, I've not seen a dentist for so many years. I want all these teeth out and, and, and a full arch. And it just seems to be, and we, we've increased in the amount of referrals that have come through since COVID as well. Do you, do you think there's, there's more of a drive for full arch work clinically in the UK? I think there's a, I think the pandemic has been really good for implant dentistry. <laughs> a lot of people, I mean, I, I travel a lot and meet a lot of clinicians there. Yeah. And I work closely with a lot of implant companies and they'll tell you the numbers have never been better. Right. So the pandemic has certainly been good for dentistry and it's been really good for implant dentistry. We're doing more implants than we've ever done. And that's across the board. It's not mm. big area, it's across the board. So naturally, we're, people are doing a lot more when it comes to full arch implant dentistry. And what's changed, it's an interesting one. I think certainly people are more cautious and aware of their appearance and, and, and things. They're not going on holiday as much, so they want mm. to spend money on themselves. They, they've had more disposable income. Uh, there's a lot more money flowing around. So naturally, people are, are, are then like, well, I might as well spend it on myself. I'm, I haven't been able to travel, go out and go shopping or go out for dinner for a long period of time. So I think that certainly had an impact. But also, I think we also have to remember that we are really behind our European partners when it comes to implants and, and the, the, the numbers of implants we're policing. So the, the growth opportunity within this country is massive. Uh, and I think it's just the years and years of clinicians and, and talking about implants it's now sort of having a real obvious effect out there that people are now thinking oh, I've got a gap I need an implant oh, I've mm. got a tooth that comes out oh an implant I think it's just the, the public are much more knowledgeable and aware around yeah. dental implants and it's a much more commonly occurring procedure in practice so when patients are going to a practice and sitting there in the waiting room they see implants plastered everywhere. Yeah, it's readily available. So I think it's all multiple factors that have then had an impact on uh, this sort of huge volume that we're seeing come through the door. And then, when it's, then naturally, you know, full, full arch implants. Well, there's a massive amount of people with that are edentulous, single or yeah. arches, or with a terminal or a failing dentition millions of people millions now i was given a presentation recently the world health organization figure is 300 million worldwide with one or both arches no teeth and in the uk the, the number is somewhere in the region of five to six million people have uh one arch that's that's a no teeth. yeah yeah so there's a massive amount and all you need to do is look at the amount of clinics that are popping up that are specifically focused on delivering full arch yeah. fixed restorations they're only doing that because there is a market for this type of work yeah and so uh, i mean do you, do you feel you know those patients that might be in that situation that are edentulous because of either neglect or for whatever reason, do you ever feel that I'm I'm not sure that this is for you? Because I think sometimes patients have that that view that oh well, their implants. I don't need to look after them. They'll just sort themselves out. And that that you know the fixation, whatever you've got on top of that superstructure is I don't need to deal with that because it's 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 implants. And I always perhaps err on the side of caution that you know is this patient going to be able to fulfil 
can I fulfill our expectations, but also are they going to be able to maintain this because of their history? Does that ever cross your mind? or yeah, cons- Absolutely, all the time. And I think this is where, again, these for large patients, you, you, they're, they're patients for life. Mm, yeah. You have to be careful about the ones that you take on. Definitely, yeah. A lot of these patients, it's, they, all, my, all of the for large patients fill, fill in a psychological questionnaire and it asks questions like, you know, do you think implants last forever? Do you think you have to maintain implants? Some really basic, obvious questions. And all it, all it does is highlight areas to go in and focus a discussion. So patients are, you can then start to educate patients. But even then, you know what, as humans, we forget. We're very forgetful. Sure. And, you know, naturally, the, exist, the dentition that was gifted to you is failed you've not looked after it maybe your fault or or something else has happened uh, and it's equally implants will fail or you'll have problems if it's not maintained or looked after and it's all fine it's like getting a new car uh, you're all excited and you keep it really clean for the first you know, six <laughs> months a year and you're like you're really you know looking after it you want it to look its best but then after a while you just kind of let things go oh, i'll be fine no, I'd, it feels fine now. I don't need to get it checked. There's no problems. Why do I need to get it checked? But I think it's it's that sort of being able to really build that relationship with the patient, where they have a belief in what you tell them, yeah. and they have that trust, where you're there looking after them, and you're not there just to swindle money off them ongoing for maintenance and hygiene, etc. But actually, look and trying to get it, get it through to them that look, this is a this is like a a car. In, in one jaw and like a car we need to service it we need to check it and it's like an MOT you need to see someone we need to take underside on the underside of it we need to take x-rays etc you can't just leave it otherwise you're going to come back and the problem's going potentially going to be too big and it's going to be too hard to fix yeah yeah and I think I think people underestimate that both patients and, and maybe some clinicians as well that you know when something small goes wrong often that that's quite impactful isn't it in the whole yeah. situation. Um, yeah, so with full arch uh, maintenance and I, and I was just lecturing on this recently. It's it's very clear patients are coming in for three to four monthly hygiene visits, annual checkups, annual X ray. I check every year that the screws are tight. Hmm. Visual assessment. If there's anything untoward, then I'll remove the prosthesis and check and uh, looking for wear and staining. Yeah. And this has to be done. And I suppose it's making sure that the patient is on board and understands because it's all fine to say, oh, yeah, but I need to check it every year. Why? I think it's important if you start to explain to the patient, I need to do this because this is what I'm looking for. Yeah. I need to do this because this is what I'm looking for. And you need to look out for this because this could be a sign of this. And when someone understands, then they're much more on board. Definitely, yeah. And and But naturally, you can do as much as you want and there's some patients that just don't get it. Yeah. They'll, they've, they've, they've said they've stopped smoking, they come back and, and they're back on the cigarettes. Yeah, that's yeah. the classic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And th- that is like That's human nature. That's human behavior. That is life. I don't think you can... You know, I think we have to be optimistic. I think that's important, cautiously optimistic when we approach these cases with patients because you don't want to be so pessimistic that you you just have doubts when when these patients come through the door, oh, you're not going to listen to me, I'm just going to judge you and no, I'm not going to offer you that. I think cautiously be optimistic, try to build relationships, get them to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it and the importance and then hopefully you'll have a good strike rate but naturally also uh, expect some patients will slip through the net and that's just life. Yeah. Don't get, you know, don't, don't, don't get too uh, dismayed by that. That's just the way things are. Yeah. So uh, sticking on the full arch, pro- what, what, I guess the common problems or some significant problems that you've encountered with full arch work that, that would be not top tips, but things to be aware of really. Learning so, points. So I think, the, 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 in general, the main thing for success with full arch is 
If you have the right surgeon, the right treatment plan, and the right patient, you'll get success, ultimately. Yeah. And those three things coming together, you'll have success. Uh, it's not one thing. You can have the right surgeon, wrong patient, you can have the right technique, and you know, you'll know you fall flat on your face uh, at times. So it's those three things that are really, really important. Common problems, what do I see in, in, my clin- in the clinical practice that I, I'm involved in? It's... Well, the literature says prosthetic. Pr- prosthetic complications are, are the big thing when it comes to a full arch implant dentistry, and that is chipping, wearing, mm. prosthesis, discoloration, screw, loos- screw loosening, screw fracture, fracture of the prosthesis, i.e. if there's an extended distal cantilever. However, I genuinely feel a lot of these problems can be mitigated with appropriate training and treatment planning. And... I rarely see problems. I genuinely rarely see problems. And, you know, people, I, I, I say I do full arch because it's straightforward. Full arch is predictable, it's reproducible. That's why I travel the country mentoring people doing it. It's very predictable treatment and it's reproducible. It's very forgiving. And it's funny, interesting, because your background is, is surgical, Richard, and you mentioned that you don't have a lot of restorative you you feel you're lacking when it comes mm. to restorative uh, I, I'm not a rest- I did zero restorative work yeah. I've never done restorative dentistry I've no idea I've always just done surgery and that the thing is like if I can restore full arch well with predictability uh, genuine in my hand I, I don't see problems okay now ask me in five years and I'll tell you maybe differently <laughs> today I don't see issues. Okay. And I'm not a restorative dentist. It's it's because what you what we're doing in full arch, and this is delivering a patient white and pink, an FP three type restorative, uh, uh, an FP three restoration, so the patient has hard and soft tissue loss. What we're doing is we're reorganizing the occlusion, so you have such great flexibility. Mm, yeah. And. We're not pushing the boundaries. We're working with the bone that the patient has. It's really predictable. It's amazing. It amazes me all the time. I'm like, this works. This just works. And you just, there's just some fundamentals that you stick to. Ideally, you know, implant, host bone, make sure it's positioned restoratively, make sure it's positioned so you've got a good amount of buckle bone. Low only immediately load when certain parameters are 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 hit, and then when it comes to the restorative side of things, make sure you construct a prosthesis that's passive and cleansable. You get you get good results. You get good results, and genuinely, Hammer, I do not see problems. Oh, that's good. It's reassuring I, to hear that. I do not see issues, and that's honest. I just don't see them now. Now, I'm only saying that now. Things could change. Two years, three years. Uh, But, yeah, back to that in terms of sort of the travelling and the mentoring. I would rather do a full arch than a single central incisor. Any day of the week. Much simpler. Much simpler. Take out the teeth, bit of an alveoplasty, raise, raise a flap, bit of an alveoplasty, four to six implants, and then we can uh, restore but yeah, it's because it's it's I've got the protocols in place. I've got a good team in place, and I, I think it's important. And I, and again, when I'm working with clinicians, I'm, I'm speaking about this. I am teaching you a technique. That's great. That's fine. However, it's it, it's just the technique. There's so much more that comes with that that you need to be aware of. Uh, the team, the people around you, supporting the surgical procedure pre surgery and post surgical mm-hmm. management of the patient is absolutely crucial yeah. from the assistant yeah. to the the support staff you have and then the, the technician you work with equally invaluable and important mm-hmm. can't do the work i do if i didn't have uh, the technician that i work with and him being on point with the restorative side of things so yeah all these things again come together if you have the right team combine it then then you do get the right results but if you were to look at the literature and what do, what do people talk about what are the main problems the main problems when it comes to full arch are prosthetic and the prosthetic issues are 
discoloration, wear, screw loosening, screw fracture, fracture of the prosthesis, chipping of interior teeth. Uh, but thankfully, uh, they can be avoided. They can be avoided with appropriate treatment planning. Yeah. So I, I get os- asked a lot by, uh, you know, colleagues, Rich, I want to get into implants. You know, what would your top tips be? What course should I do? If if somebody came to you and said, I really want to get into implant surgery as a general practitioner or, you know, even um, an oral surgeon that's not done a lot of implant work, and want to get into full arch work, what what kind of where would you direct them other than obviously saying I'll I'll mentor you, but what kind of process and length I know the length of time might vary between individuals, but that that training and mentorship program, would you advise a one to one more appropriately than a because it's quite easy to go and do a two day course, isn't it? And then think, oh I'll just put this into practice. And I think for me that I, I see issues with that. A hundred percent. I think I think the the most important thing when it comes to getting started is uh, why 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 you why do you want to do this? Sure. I'm trying to understand what why this clinician has has started to embark on this journey and how committed are they? Where do they want to get to? And is their environment suited to them developing an implant practice? It's very well spending ten twenty thousand investing in an MSC. It's very well thinking, oh, I'll get a mentor in. But actually, if you're an associate and your practice isn't set up or is not willing to invest in all the equipment, et cetera, required for you to start doing implant dentistry, then you really are wasting your money because you can go and get the education, you can get the practical experience, but if you can't then start to adopt that into daily practice, it's going to be wasted. You've got to do this work day in, day out. So I really feel that is the most important thing where you've got the right environment and the right support to help you develop into an implant dentist. And then what's an added bonus is if you're in a practice around people that are willing to support you and uh, mentor you within implant dentistry. So there are obviously big uh, multidisciplinary practices that have other clinicians that maybe do implants. Are they supportive of you starting on this journey? Are they going to be a sounding board for you uh, when you have a patient with a that potentially requires a dental implant. And I think that's equally important. Some clinicians, you know, they come to me and they're in a, a two surgery practice and the, the, the other dentist is, is doing cosmetic dentistry and they're on their own and they're young and they're isolated and they've got no one to call on for help, etc. They're really up against it to, to get on this journey and, and develop. I, I've only been able to really fast track my development because I've been able to step away and not focused on earning at all, taking time out of practice, travel, watch other people, how they work, learn from them, just cancel days in practice to go, right, and I, I could cancel days because I was a practice owner. I, I cancelled days, travelled three, four hours, s- s- stood by someone's side, assisting them, doing implants, and then I, I was able to really upskill really, really quickly because I got the work and I got the experience and I got the exposure. However, in a single-handed practice or, or two or three dentists and you're not getting the work coming through, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. So it's understanding what's required to to be able to, uh, to upskill is really, really important. And some pe- I suppose some people are naive and they're thinking that, they maybe think they can do an MSc or a course and they can then start. You know, mm. you know, with implant, we're always learning. It never stops. And yeah, I I do a high volume of implant dentistry now and with a primary focus on full arch. But do I feel I know it all? All I know is that the more I think I know, the more I realize I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, you're like, oh, I thought true. I knew that, but clearly I don't. And I've got so much to learn within implant dentistry and I've been doing it full time and implant only for the last sort of five years. So it's a vast area. And I suppose that's the beauty of the of the of the discipline in the fact that it's it's very much based around the patient and the unpredictable nature of a patient and how they're going to respond biologically and psychologically to the treatment that we do for them 
So, yeah, I, I think it, it is important. I, I always say to clinicians, you know, make sure you're getting advice from others. Uh, make sure you have good people around you to help support you. Uh, if you are going to embark on a course, then think of your ROI, so your return on investment. If you're going to spend 20000 or 25000 on an MSc, when are you likely to get that kind of money back? All these kind of things. And then you need to think about building a brand, building yourself up, uh, getting yourself out there within your practice and local community as a clinician that's now offering dental implants. Because ultimately, it's a numbers game. You get better at implant dentistry the more you do. Yeah. yeah. Simple as that. So it, it's all about numbers. So it, to develop, that's the focus. Get the training, get the mentorship, and then the focus is how do I get more numbers? How do I get more numbers? How do I start doing implants every single day? Yeah. Because if you're doing an implant one every two months, then really that's not economical. That's not worth your while. And you're better focused on other things. And it might yeah. be a bit harsh, but honestly, it's just not worth it. And it can't be, it's usually quite stressful if you're doing something. You know, if I was to do a class two amalgam, I'd be like, right, <laughs> I've not done this for ages or, or a root treatment. And the last time I did a root treatment was 10 years ago. I'd be, I'd be stressed about it. And yeah. it's the same thing if you're not doing implants all the time and then you get an implant and you're like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then you're like, oh, oh, we've not done one for ages. I've got all the stock in place. Oh, I need to order the implants. Oh, what system should I use? Oh, it's just... It's, yeah, oh, it becomes like, stressful. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it doesn't need to be stressful. You know, that aspect doesn't need to be stressful. The work we do can be stressful, but let's not make it more stressful than it needs to be. Yeah. I think one of the things that you said there is is a really good point saying, to, you know, when I say, what you know, what's a top tip for getting started on implant dentistry or full arch work is to say to that clinician, why do you want to do it? And I think we're perhaps it's something we don't think about or people don't think about as much as we should. What's my aim here? What's the goal for this? Um, and and what's that drive to become, you know, that being able to place however many uh, per year and do however many full arches per year for my patients. I think that that's really interesting. It's something that people should probably have at the forefront of their mind rather than the back of their mind at the start. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Richard. And you know, we, we need, we need drivers. We need goals. mm -hmm. Yeah. Because otherwise what are we aiming towards? And, and I'll tell you why I do what I do because people, people are like, well, you're just all over the place. You're just, but for me, it's all about impact. And so I know I can have a huge impact on a patient. I do this work because it's big impact treatment. My background, my experience was doing cancer work, fracture mandibles. As an assistant, I wasn't doing the work, but I helped surgeons do free lap surgery and orthognathic surgery. And I loved being part of that team and, and helping that little bit, even if it was just as the guy that retracted. I loved being a part of the surgical team doing big surgery. Now in primary care, in, in, in general practice, the biggest surgery that we can do is, is full art surgery. And for me, it's sort of recreating my life as a, as a younger clinician in my own environment, in my own setting. That's the way I see it. So I like to do big, impactful surgery. Hence, I've developed into someone that has a real focus on full arch. I love the being able to change a patient's life and you know letting the patient see it and they're so thankful I get patients now that I've done full arch for they send me birthday text messages I see them for review and I'm like are you happy you had this done it's the best decision I ever made etc so it's big surgery it's yeah. impactful makes me feel good it's all about me here it makes me feel good but then when it came to the training side of things I thought how can I have a bigger impact and for me, I can have a bigger impact if I can train a thousand dentists to do the work I do, to have the same reproducibility, the predictability and the outcomes that I get with Full Arch. So that is one of the drivers for me to push my education side is that my drive is to have a bigger impact. And so it's very clear to me, you know, I don't need other people to align with it or believe it. This is this is in my head. This is my goal. And it's personal to me. For me, it's about impact, and my vehicle for impact is through education around full arch. But whatever your your goal is, your drive is, 
you need to discover that, have that as a focus and then move towards it. And I think that's really, I found that really, really uh, sort of enlightening and just changed everything for me. That sort of North Star that I'm aiming towards on a constant basis, that's really, really helped me find direction and purpose in my daily practice. And and that brings us very nicely on to the book, Being Unstoppable, which is, you know, the mindset of a great clinician that says here on the front cover. And it, it's, I've not finished it, but I've probably three quarters of the way through and it, it is well worth reading. Um, and everything you've talked about tonight, you know, it, it's, it's really refreshing to listen to somebody with such enthusiasm about, um, about their career and about their their clinical activity, but also about that drive to to share that experience, that knowledge, and clinical activity with colleagues. And I think that's um, it is absolutely superb. And it it will there's things that I I will think about now after this podcast that I thought, oh, why do I do that? What's my what's my drive to do that? And um, I, I think that's really important that probably we're we don't think about as much but also just focusing your mindset and everything else you talk about in the book about confidence leadership skills um and developing as a clinician to to your full potential so it's it's well worth reading um and it's been absolutely fantastic to talk to you this evening so i i'm glad i managed to pin you down so i know how busy you are flying across the country um which I, I wouldn't say I'm envious of, but it, it, it's, you know, we're both in education, but it, it's superb that you you have that ability to go around the country sharing your experience and developing other clinicians to become better clinicians and maybe becoming unstoppable as well. So it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you this evening, Fernand. Thank you so much. And, um, yeah, for those of you that, that haven't followed you on social media, they must because it's it's not just about what you're doing day to day, but it's about that educational experience as well. And there's loads of tips that you share on there. Um, so do do follow. Um, so thanks. It's been brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast and any resources will be linked in the description. Please do leave a review and rate the podcast on the iTunes store. I hope you join me for the next episode. Goodbye for now.